first of all, welcome to the uh, webinar for tonight. And um, if you have uh, visited before and listened to some of my webinars or try to listen to my webinars, there's always some technical difficulty. But uh, I hope that uh, this time I uh, go through it smoothly. If you have not heard about my work or not familiar with my work, I have a strong background in uh, animal um, science with a particular uh, specialty in uh, equine nutrition, done various studies in, in equine nutrition. And my latest project was uh, for my uh, PhD, where I looked at uh, behavioral mechanisms of uh, diet selection. So I had a, a very keen focus on foraging behavior and smell and taste. And I'm still awaiting the results, so it's kind of exciting. I hope soon to, uh, to hear if I passed or not. But besides my academic career, I'm also consulting, and that's why I'm talking tonight here, uh, where I combine equine nutrition with my environmental consulting, and particularly focusing on pasture and property. And on the sideline, I also do some equitation, so I'm also an official and a coach. So I have also the sporting hat on. So as you can see, many hats. And my latest uh, kind of project is the um, equine permaculture movement, which we uh, founded last year which is really all about uh, responsible horse keeping and sustainable living using permaculture principles, but not limited to. So it's about um, holistic management, it's about sustainable principles to take care of the land and our horses so to improve um, like a kind of a holistic uh, approach to, to things. And uh, very exciting, we will hopefully have some uh, PDCs or permaculture designer courses happening, uh, particularly focusing for the equine community. But I will tell more about that at the end. So let's get started uh, with this uh, webinar, where we're going to talk about enrichment, in particular for horses, of course. So one of the, the things that we're going to discuss is, very briefly, but it's very important, is why we look at enrichment. Why would enrichment be considered in keeping, in horse keeping? Then a little bit about the definition, because that leads us into some of the the types uh, of enrichment that are that is available to us. So enrichment in general has been over the last 25 years has gotten more interest and has studied probably in more detail, particularly for zoo animals, research animals, and farm animals. And horses have not been missed out, but there is reasonably limited information. As you can see here at the bottom, I, um, I stated here one of the studies of a, of a group that um, looked at uh, a couple of uh, enrichment items on activity and social interaction in domesticated horses. And this publication is reasonably new, like 2011. And there are some other publications, and I will highlight them throughout this presentation. But, but overall, there's not as much as what you would expect with, with zoo animals or um, with research animals such as rats and laboratory rats and mice. So let's first talk about why enrichment. And clearly, we have taken the horse out of its natural environment, and we house them in typical two ways. And there's very variation, so I'm kind of really kind of putting them in two boxes. But we have the stabling. And um, actually, on this side, you will see a particular stable situation in Holland, where Horses are typically kept for half of the year in stables and go out um, for an hour a day or when they're ridden or they are in a walker. And then we have um, more the Australian situation where 80% of the horses are kept on pasture for 16 hours or more and, um, and either are housed only when needed for, you know, for particular activities. Um, but also depending on the class of horses and the industry, so race horses versus leisure horses will also be kept very differently. So what we see is that captivity, the way we keep horses, it doesn't really matter if we have pastures or um, stabling, um, they will depend in size. And of course, the bigger the pasture and the more space you have available, um, the more you could resemble something from nature. But what we see in both environments is that together with the way we're feeding horses, and we discussed this already in one of the earlier webinars, is the way we feed them with um, low forage, so low fiber feeds and high, and high sugary feeds from either cereal grains or also um, kind of improved pastures. These can affect the horse, horse, our horse community in three major ways, which are listed here. So neurological metabolic 
and digestive disorders are quite common in the uh, domestic horse population and these all can affect the behavior. So for instance, if you look at uh, neurological, we can see for instance the particular boredom type of behavior, so called stereotypic behaviors or vices, where they are repetitive, have no purpose and are indicators of welfare issues such as wood chewing, crib biting, um, wind sucking, weaving, boundary walking. So we can divide them in locomotive and in oral behaviors and I think that quite a lot of uh, horse owners are aware of these and um, I showed actually in one of the webinars some uh, good footage of a locomotive behavior, of a stereotypic behavior and um, this oral type of behavior. And of course metabolism is of course where we get problems in insulin and obesity and digestive disorders such as um, ulcers and Heimgard acidosis that may lead to, um, to laminitis. So either from pasture or from grain feeding and, and of course this will affect the behavior of the horse as well. So we really need to think about um, enriching the, the horse's life in captivity to really try to reduce some of these, um, these either uh, neurological um, or metabolism or digestive um, disorders. So if we then go one step back and, and go back to the natural environment, the one first question is do horses in the wild need enrichment? And the answer is no. Nature doesn't need enrichment because horses will be occupied, as we know, for a large part of the day with foraging. Up to 16 hours has been um, kind of studied that they would forage and we have migrative behavior looking for, of course, food, for water resources and in the wild situation we also have to uh, avoid predators. So the occupation throughout the day um, will be quite largely dictated by kind of the processes of life, of survival, of course social behavior and reproductive behavior and therefore there is not really any space for boredom and also um, there is generally no uh, borders such as fences and, um, and that makes life indeed quite enriched. But when we then look at how we could um, take this concept, so a natural environment into captivity, we always come to some limitation. We can never really replicate it. However, what we do, um, what we can do is look at uh, particular techniques, types of enrichment, products that we can use, um, designs that we can use to try to mimic as much as we can this uh, natural environment and occupation uh, of horses in captivity, such as our horses. So, when we look at the definition, which has been really well described in one of the studies uh, 20 years ago, so that is Newberry. So if you're very interested in this kind of work, this is a, a very highly cited paper for, um, for this, in this particular field of environmental enrichment. And it is an animal husbandry pr principle that seeks to enhance the quality of captive animal care by identifying and providing the environmental stimuli necessary for optimal psychological and physio physiological well-being and what our aim is is to reduce as I said these either abnormal behaviors so the frequency of abnormal behaviors we never really seem to fully eradicate some of them and I think that if you have a an x race horse and you have kind of rehabilitated that and you give them quite a lot of fiber uh, even with slow feeding hay nets you probably still uh, may encounter some crib biting um, throughout its life and we see that some of these behaviors don't really leave the animal. They kind of have been ingrained in their kind of pattern of, you know, of, of coping with daily life even though they may be not as um, confined in, in or bored in, um, as what they was previously. So it's more about, I think we never can eradicate it, but it's about reducing the frequency of abnormal behaviors. I think we should be very realistic that if it's not a magic bullet enrichment, but more importantly, it's about reducing chronic stress. That is very that, that's a very important aspect because chronic stress, long term, can be very um, damaging on the mental and the physiology of the horse. And then digestive problems. We want to avoid, um, you know, like for instance, colic and ulcers and things like that. And we can do that by forms of enrichment. So. Let's have a look at the types of enrichment that um, we have available. Actually, one of the study that I just mentioned from Newberry 
divided enrichment in, in kind of four aspects. And here I have six. And there is actually a bit of overlap. So if you really kind of dissect it, you can probably pin it down to four. But I wanted to individually, these six, this kind of discuss them and provide you with some uh, papers if, um, if I found some on any of these uh, enrichment uh, strategies. Some you may be familiar with, others is kind of more of a combination. Uh, you may have not thought about training, for instance, as, as an enrichment, but we'll go through of each of these. So first, sensory behavior. And this is the category that stimulates the senses. And you may be familiar with for instance, smell and taste, and of course, touch and visual. Those are kind of, and, and, and um, sound, those are very um, interesting ways to kind of enrich the environment. And here, I actually have some um, papers that um, discuss, for instance, the influence of music on the emotional state of racehorses. Um, in 2002, there was a preliminary study on the effect of music and behavior. So there is, over the last 15 years, we definitely have looked at, uh, at different types of music and the effect on how animals behave, particularly in stable environments. I'm not really familiar with having any studies on pasture, but you know, in stable environments where the horse is probably more confined and restricted, boredom seems to be more of a problem compared to the prevalence of problems is is, is higher in, in stabled horses compared to pastured horses. And it seems that certain types of music, uh, more relaxing type of music, can uh, help the effective state of the animal, whether music that is very kind of like loud seems to be kind of not having that same effect. So the type of music seems to be very important. Um, there's a study here that actually look at the use of mirrors um, in stable environments in a way to reduce some of the stereotypic behavior such as weaving and that show to, to be on short term um, give some effect or reduce some of these behaviors. And um, there's here actually a photo of a horse, of a show jumping horse, famous show jumping horse in the UK that actually has its own stable that can watch uh, TV. So it's show jumping uh, um, live TV. And I don't know exactly of any studies that looked at visual stimulation in, in, in horses and how well they respond, but I know that um, some studies, for instance, in dogs and some other animals seem to be quite successful um, to, to kind of get a, a type of uh, relaxation and reduce some of stereotypic behaviors. So something to just consider. However, None of these are really, I think, on its own separate, unless you really kind of add music. I think that a lot of these are linked to, for instance, social, of course, when we talk about uh, touch and yeah, social, for instance, taste and smell are linked to feeding. So, and visual, again, social, and also environmental aspects. So they're not, in a way, they're separate and in a way also linked. So let's go to feeding, which is, of course, very important, not only to provide on a daily basis the adequate amount of food and the nutrients uh, that the horse needs, uh, the minerals and vitamins and, and everything, but it's also about looking from, a, from an enrichment point of view, we're looking at, uh, at it in a way where we can make feeding time more fun and challenging. So different methods of food presentation to encourage the animals thinking on, and working for their food as they would kind of do in the wild. And of course, it depends a bit on the on the animal. Some animals use tools, whether, which is, for instance, monkeys um, have been shown to use tools. Whether in other with other animals, it's pretty much less because, well, they have no fingers, and so they're a bit limited to to what they um, what we can use to to kind of um, enrich that. So a very famous um, idea is, of course, like the the horse ball or the cylinder, where you have this trickle feeding of of pellets. And uh, some studies have been done, um, uh, well, quite a while back, 20 years back, where we looked at this device, um, the food bowl, and looked at the behavior of stable horses. So yeah, that increased the feeding time and their searching time. But of course, on its own, it's it's one one solution. It's not a magic bullet to increase feeding time. Um, here you see two photos of zoo animals, and it doesn't have to be necessarily a commercial available um, system. You can make, you can be as creati creative as you want. So for, for instance, here we see a, a, a um, old water bottle that uh, they cut open and put leaves in, and 
um, giraffes have to use their tongue to get to the leaf. So it kind of occupies them while they're in their enclosure. And the same thing here, using a ball and some food um, with zebra. So uh, what we're really doing is um, trying to extend the feeding time, make it a little bit harder for the animal uh, instead of just pretty much giving them a bucket of food or giving uh, a bis you know, two biscuits or three biscuits of hay at the same time. So that brings me to the next thing, and I think that most, most horse owners are quite familiar with this and already doing it is, the, of course, looking at roughage, at the type of roughage and uh, using slow feeding hay nets or offering uh, different varieties of, of forage, so for instance, lucent hay and grass hay. And uh, th this is actually a study uh, from in 2005, so pretty much 10 years ago, where they looked at forage enrichment, foraging enrichment in uh, housed horses, and they looked at how different types of food, and also in different areas of the of the uh, stable, if they had to walk to certain stables, how that would influence their feeding time and um, and, uh, and diet selection. And it shows that uh, when you offer more forages, you kind of kind of simulate. Uh, the variety that they would have in vegetation in the wild. So what you're offering is just more choice, and more choice means, hey, I can choose and I can actually select and, and search between those two to, um, to find the preferred food. So having more choice is a way to enrich the environment, also offering foods for longer, and that's where the slow feeding concept comes in. And um, research has shown that if you decrease the hay net holes of the of, of, of typical normal hay nets, we can extend some of the time. But it showed recent research from last year is actually highlighting that that is probably only with like maybe max an hour on a 24-hour uh, day period. And um, so they kind of said, well, we may have to actually be even a bit smarter by putting more, you know, another hay net over. So do a double or triple, and there. Um, I think that paper is also now currently already published, but that may increase a little bit more the feeding time because they seem to find that a lot of horses were finishing with their feed before 10 p.m. and then they still have the whole night. So slow feeding hay nets can be useful, but it should not be considered on its own as the magic bullet to you know to kind of extend feeding time and to reduce boredom. But it's a, a very good strategy, and additionally, you can look at other feeding, kind of supplementary feeding strategies. So you may uh, look at, uh, for instance, low GI products, such as super fibers that you can add and um, and offer maybe in a in a at certain times. Uh, you can have it also in like a trickle feeder. You can be quite creative with it. Also, what we can do with feeding is actually look at variety within the food. So we can either offer um, horses uh, flavors with um, where we kind of keep the consistency of the food, kind of adding either herbs or we add uh, commercial, natural, or synthetic flavors to kind of change that uh, every, every so often, so every two weeks or a month, where we want to kind of create novelty. So enrichment is also about novelty, and we can create it with feeding by trying very slowly, not abruptly, change some of the characteristics of the food. And, and that's actually kind of a little bit my research uh, that touched a little bit on that. So I looked at the effect of flavor change on food intake by horses. And what I found is that it will take at least five days for horses to adapt to a flavor change, even though the, 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 the food I presented was similar. But they seem to do that quite well and, and accept it quite rapidly. So it's a safe way to kind of create novelty uh, without you know, without changing anything in the, the nutritional structure. Um, also, free choice feeding, particular like lip blocks and, and minerals, is one of those things that you can consider. Toys, man manipulative toys, I think that a lot of people um, are aware of them or are already using them. So the famous horse balls and some of these chewing toys. These are actually two photos of my research horses, and um, I actually used I have to say that I use the, the horse ball as a um, novel object test. So you can see here like an orange line, and they had to, um, um, to touch, the, touch the ball to see what kind of character, kind of to, temp, to test the temperament. But um, I used it afterwards in, the, in their enclosures and also the chewing toy. But they were in with, with multiple horses, so I had two groups of six. But they seemed to not be too interested in them, or at least in my in my trial, the horses were not 
really interested in the toys. But it really depends on horses and um, also if you then combine it, so of course, if you combine a toy with something that is edible, you may get a, a, a different effect. So for instance, here making your own device with a bucket and then either carrots or apples to, um, to, to make it interesting. So I don't want to spend too much time on toys, but it's really about um, kind of stimulating the investigation and exploratory behavior. And I think that's quite clear. Let's move to the environment because this is a very, um, very important and probably maybe if you rank it, one of the first ones to consider is, of course, the environment. The more we can replicate um, the wild environment, so offering different types of vegetation, have vegetation, because if we look at the other side, there's nothing to chew here, um, we are already doing a, a lot for the horse. And they can select on their own, they can, and then can, they can search, they can occupy their day. And of course here we have also the social aspect. So um, environment and social seem to be very important. And if you are taking care of the environment, generally there will be food availability. So you kind of, in a way, address already a lot of, of aspects of enrichment. But if we look at like certain situations where we have high erosion due, due to droughts, uh, forest fires or flooding, uh, or high rain areas, you can either get mud situation or dust situations. And I don't, I already kind of discussed this in a couple of previous webinars, but that always, always have an effect on the health of the horse. And as you can see, not so good for the land um, organizations such as land care and um, natural resource management groups really would like to see much more this kind of, um, this kind of situation where, you know, we, we have a plus for the land and, and we also tick the box for animal welfare. So in cases where you don't have as much space, you don't have uh, hundreds, of eight, hundreds of acres to, to house horses and also in groups and you only have one or two horses or, or multiple horses um, in the small groups, you can still do quite a lot by thinking about your design. So environmental enrichment is really a category that is to enhance the habitat with opportunities that change or add complexity to the environment. And here I kind of have a kind of a bit of a picture of the um, of the uh, uh, design of a smaller property where we still have paddocks for cell grazing, where we can open certain paddocks and close certain paddocks, and these are connected with a, a track system. So the famous track paddocks, you may be familiar with it, and. Um, these can come in all different um, kind of um, kind of conformations and different footings, and um, it can be linked to also a loafing area or a central point system. And I highlighted here with different aspects what what can you actually do um, specifically in in such a smaller environment. So, for instance, feeding. So I am very uh, fond of. Uh, browse and um, it seems to occupy the horse. It, it's quite technical. The horse needs to learn sometimes how to take a leaf off. And for instance, here you see one of my research horses with bamboo, and they really have to kind of learn the technique. And you can place these here at these orange stations to um, to kind of occupy the horse at certain points when they are on the track. We can also think about, for instance. Obstacles, so we have on this side and on that side are two ways, and this is probably a little bit more fancy, but using logs uh, where horses have to either step over or jump over or go through, so this is a very fancy design in, in the States. Um, and it really depends, you don't have to go um, as extreme as that, I think, but I just want to show you, you can be as creative as that. Um, some people like the idea of having these food baths where the horse has to walk through water. and um, Generally, these are hard surfaces so that um, you can avoid, for instance, having horses in a dam, so you keep your dam clean and having horses outside the dam, but still horses can kind of play in these water pools and especially when you're in hot situations, this is a great idea. So it depends a little bit on your setup, depends a bit on your money and of course your climate, what is possible. You have to think about footing. When we talk about environmental enrichment, we sometimes have to think about these tracks and um, to avoid erosion we are have to use like for instance like a p-rock or like a gravel and then we have here um, like a kind of a plastic honeycomb shape um, erosion control matting system which um, you can fill either with p-rock or with sand and this helps particular on spots where you have high traffic areas 
it's a bit expensive, but it's, again, one of those uh, options that you can integrate. So you don't have to do that for, for all areas, but it's something just to, to consider. And I don't think this is all of the examples I have. I just wanted to show a few, and it's really about being creative. So you can really add to this, and it's, it's, um, it really depends also on the time, time you have uh, to, um, to invest in, uh, in building something like that. Of course, social is very important. I think that I already highlighted that we cannot really see this separately. It kind of integrates in the environmental aspect. And um, for instance, in sensory, yeah, that touch uh, is very important uh, horses. And I don't think I have to address some of the, you know, like the research that we've done in feral horses and wild horses that show some of these bonds that uh, females have. And it actually is also very important for reproduction. And uh, companions in particular where um, movement is limited, such as stables, where isolation can happen quite, uh, quite easily, is something to consider. Um, and there's a lot of research done on the effects of, you know, how we manage horses, and and um, and social isolation seems to be um, quite, uh, quite can quite impact the the well-being of a horse. And actually, adding social um, social enrichment has shown to also help with reducing some of these. Um, kind of locomotive behavior such as weaving. That's, for instance, that uh, mirror study that, uh, that I showed um, earlier with the visual uh, sensory uh, enrichment, enrichment. And then as last that I want to address is training. And I don't want to spend too much time on it, and I don't want to discuss all the possible potential training things you can do with a horse, but it's really about spending time with a horse using ethical principles. It's all about trying to um, Exercise the horse. It's also good for um, for its health, eh? reducing uh, metabolic disorders and overweight in horses. And what we really would like to do is avoid chronic stress. We know that training will have always some form of acute stress when we learn a new movement or we go on a trail ride and there's something scary. There's always or we go on a competition, and that's okay. That's in a way healthy stress as long as you don't inflict training methods that cause long-term uh, chronic stress. And for instance here, uh, that's a photo of me with my research horses. And um, this man was quite um, uh, quite in interested in interaction with humans. And so he quickly wanted to interact by taking my head off and giving it back. So um, yeah, this is kind of every day um, trying to occupy her with that was um, was a form of enrichment during the, during the research um, period where I had to check up on them and make sure that they're all okay. And at the same time, spending a little bit of time with them is a form of enrichment. So either training or interaction and, and brushing is also, of course, an interaction. So these can all help with enriching the life of horses. So in summary, uh, it's very important that we acknowledge um, the adaptive behavior of the horse, um, what has originally been designed for, spending a large time of their uh, of their of their budget on foraging, and that we acknowledge that the way that we keep horses um, can significantly influence um, uh, the behavior of the horse, either neurological or to metabolism or to digestive uh, systems, and that we have manipulated. And this affects, you know, the mental health and physiological health of the horse. And what we really need to do is look at supportive, uh, support adaptive behavior in stable and at pasture. It's not only in stables. And we can use the, the, the principles of enrichment, like the six types of enrichment to, to achieve that. But I don't see them as separate. I think they, they kind of are in the combination. Although I highlighted that, for instance, environmental um, feeding and social are probably the three most important and the rest you know, it's kind of additional. I don't think that toys on its own will be very successful if you don't acknowledge, you know, environment or social aspects. So we, um, we can rank them, but I think it's kind of a combination of all of them that we can, can combine. And, and, um, and looking at, for, for instance, if you're limited, if you don't have enough pasture availability, that you look at uh, certain designs. And in further workshops in the next uh, webinar, We'll actually we'll have one webinar that we'll go and talk a little bit more about design um, features for that. Also thinking about feed products and timing and, and, and the way you feed it, um, you kind of your strategies is um, very important to consider. For more information about 
how to care for horses in for confined horses. Um, horses Hay has actually a booklet um, that you can download from the website. And I'm happy to um, to take um, any questions. We have two uh, sorry, we have two actually two specials. Um, I'm offering currently at a reduced price uh, the equine permaculture booklet with um, a number of articles that are addressing pasture, nutrition, and property design. And there will be many other events, uh, webinars, and I think also actual face-to-face -face workshop uh, that you can find on the Horse SA website.